Oh, here we go. <laughs> But I would like to thank you all so much for having us out this week. Uh, we're really excited to be a part of this summer celebration. So yes, my name is Joe Matheson. I am the editor and tech guy on our program, Rome Boys. Uh, a little family background on my dad's side of the family. Uh, I'm a, well, first off, I'm a fifth generation farmer. I'm a cotton farmer out in West Texas. And right now it's so dry that I have a lot of opportunities to do stuff like this, so. There's not much going on in the farming world. Born and raised Catholic. Um, well, like I said, my dad's side of the family, we, he had an uncle, my great uncle, who was uh, the bishop of Amarillo Diocese back in the 80s. Uh, hey, he had a brother who was a Monsignor in that same diocese. They had a sister who was a Benedictine nun who lived in Florida. My grandfather was actually in the seminary. I am very thankful he got out for obvious reasons. My brother became a priest. As I said before, my, my great uncle Leroy, Bishop Leroy, was into a genealogy where he studies the family tree and he discovered that Matheson, my last name, is actually means son of Matthias. So he discovered that we were either direct descendants of the apostle Matthias or his followers. So you can say that Catholicism is pretty strong in my family. The force is strong with us, you know. But as for me growing up, faith was more of just a checklist. It was something that we did just to make mom and daddy happy. You know, we went to church on Sunday because mom and daddy said so. Went to CCD on Wednesday nights because mom and daddy said so. Went to youth group because the girls were cute. And mom and daddy said so. You know, so it, my point is, is that it was more of my family's faith than it was mine. It was, it was more of a family tradition. Um, I can't say that I really took my faith for granted as much as maybe I didn't really have one. You know, it was just something we did. It was just one of those things. I did it because that's what mom and daddy did. If it's good enough for them, I guess it's good enough for me. So fast forward, uh, I met a cute little Brownwood girl and uh, she was born and raised Baptist, and we got married in 2004. And currently we have five beautiful kids, three wonderful girls, and two insanely crazy boys. But again, my faith wasn't really that important to me until somebody else, somebody else's faith became, was dependent really on mine, you know, my kids. So kind of to back it up, when my, when my wife and I got married, she was a school teacher. Uh, she was a diagnostician for one of our local schools. And when we had our first daughter, she's like, I can't leave her, I want to be a stay-at-home mom. And by the grace of God, we've been able to make it work and it's been a, one of the most wonderful decisions we ever made. And uh, so then our second daughter, JC, was born and as the years went by, it was time to start thinking about school. And well, my wife being in public education said she didn't want her kids going to public school. I said, okay. So she started digging into homeschool cur curriculums. Again, a wonderful decision we made. We haven't looked back. And but at the time I was like, well, you're the educator, so you're gonna have to figure out how to teach these kids. I'll figure out how to pay for it. So again, by the grace of God, we've been able to do that. But sometime in between JC and right after our third daughter, Gracie, was born, we had found, my wife had done the research and found a homeschool co-op or a homeschool group nearby. Well, I say nearby, it was an hour's drive from our house back in her hometown. And so we applied to the school and we got in. One of the things that we had to do during to be received into the school was sign a profession of faith. 
And as again, as I said before, my faith wasn't really all that important to me. And so first one on the list is, do you believe in God? Well, that's easy. Check. Do you believe in Jesus? Check. No problem. Do you believe that the Bible is the only revelation we have from God? Hmm. I knew there was something wrong with that question, but I signed it anyway. And so our kids started attending that school. And uh, it was shortly after our third daughter, Gracie, was born. My wife wanted to stay home with her. I don't know, maybe wanted to recover or something. I don't know. You know, it was like two days after she was born, she wanted to stay home. You know? So anyway, I was, rec I was uh, asked to bring the girls to school very nicely. And so I did. And at the time, when I dropped them off, there was a certain uh, field trip scheduled that I wasn't aware of. And I was voluntold to be a chaperone to another church campus down the road that had a traveling museum. Man, it was pretty neat. Went in, saw a lot of artifacts from overseas and all that kind of stuff. But then on one side of the room, they had these kind of uh, cubicle walls, these short little walls. And on it, they had these posters of the biographies of the Reformation's kind of key players. You know, you had John Calvin, you had uh, King Henry VIII and Zwingli and a few others. And the last one that I got hung up on was Martin Luther. And I remember reading this bio and thinking, you know, they just had him portrayed as this great hero that saved Christianity from the evil Catholic Church. Something just didn't seem right about it. And, but again, my faith wasn't that important to me, so I was just like, oh well. So I dropped his kids off back at school and I start making my way home, that hour drive back to work. Anybody ever had a rock in your shoe? You know how irritating that is and you just can't keep your mind off of that rock. You twing it around between your toes, you move it from one side of your sock to the other. Why do we don't just take our shoes off and dump it out right away? I don't know. That was my ride home. It just irritated me to the core that I think it was God really using my pride against me because I just kept remember thinking, you know, are they teaching my kids this stuff? I don't know if it's true, but are they teaching my kids this stuff? And it really drove me to do something that wasn't in my nature to do. Study. I'm not a studier. I don't like to read. It's not very fun for me, and I'm not very good at it. Maybe that's why I don't think it's very much fun. So I started really diving in, and I was reading things that I was not qualified to read, things that were just completely over my head, names I couldn't pronounce, and it was just a little overwhelming at first. And it really shocked my wife, because she'd come home, and I'd be laying in bed, and I was reading a book, and she was what are you doing? I said, I'm reading. She said, yeah, but that's not Dr. Seuss. See, up to this point in our marriage, the only thing she ever saw me read was Dr. Seuss. And sometimes it was to the kids. Over time, I was starting to like, learn a lot of the things that, of why we believe and what we believe. And I was sharing this with my wife. And like I said, my wife was a Baptist and she converted to Catholicism so we could all go to the same church. I like to call it a Bathlic. You know, that's where she converted just so we could go to the same church but she had, at heart, she was still a Baptist. So, a Catholic. And so, I was revealing what I was learning. I was sharing with her what I was learning. And some of the conversations we had were, got a little heated. She would come back to me with some argument or some disagreement that she had against Catholicism. And I had no idea what she was talking about. And so, I would dig in and find out what she was talking about and then come back to her with the answer. And over time, both of our eyes were opened, or the scales fell from our eyes. And we really had our, what you call an aha moment. You know what that is, an aha moment, where all of a sudden you're like, I get it. This is true. This is real. Now what are you going to do about it? And we really... At one point, we really kind of was like, you know, maybe we're going to regret learning all of this stuff because you can't unlearn it. You know, it can be very challenging. But once you come to the knowledge of the truth, there is no turning back. And so we really started diving in and I became very zealous for the faith, so much so that, you know, I was trying 
in my mind, everyone needed to become Catholic. And I did my best to shove it down everybody's throat, uh, especially my Protestant friends. Some of them still talk to me. But on top of learning all this stuff, we started teaching CCD, started getting involved in the RCIA program. My wife, we had left the non-denominational school and she had started a Catholic homeschool group out of our home. And again, we were, but for me, there was this desire to do something more. And then these two guys moved to town and they had a bunch of kids. We had a lot in common with these guys. They had a bunch of kids and they homeschooled their kids and they taught CCD and they taught RCIA and we had a lot in common. And we started hanging out and the same, they had a desire to do something more. And so we're sitting around Tony's table, his kitchen table. I have five kids, as I said before, he has seven four boys and three girls. Chris, who we'll meet later, he'll hopefully show up pretty soon. He has six girls. So between the three of us, we have 18 kids running around this house as we're sitting at this table discussing the faith and just having a ball, enjoying every minute of it. And we just had this idea. They both had the desire to do something more. And this is where Rome Boys was born. It was kind of I call it the we're the Wayne's world of Catholic media. I had told that to some teenagers a while back that we're the Wayne's world. And they said, they looked at me like, what is that? I said, ask your parents. It really made me feel old. But anyway, so on the program, like I said before, I'm the tech guy and the editor, but I'm also the farmer. I bring the kind of uh, practical, no nonsense, get your hands dirty kind of perspective. Yeah, you know, like I like to say, that those guys are the smart guys. I'm the comic relief. But being the farmer, and this talk is called cultivating the faith. So, do we have any farmers in the house? None. Okay. Well, we have some defining to do. What does cultivating the faith mean? First of all, cultivating simply means to grow. Google it. That's all it means. Cultivating means to grow. So, in cotton farming, which is what I do. One of the old pieces of equipment we had was called the cultivator. This was before the giant spray rigs that we have now that we use to spray chemicals to get rid of our weeds. The cultivator was a piece of equipment that gets pulled behind the tractor. It has some sweeps that go between the crop. So the crop is already up and growing and the plow, the sweeps go through and they cut the roots out and they kill the weeds that are growing between the crop sick because the crop and for some reason the weeds always grow a lot faster than the crop and they take the moisture away from the crop and really diminish the yield potential that we might have so we got to get rid of those weeds i couldn't think of a better analogy and if you watch the show i love analogies i couldn't think of a better analogy for our faith life for cultivating our faith because think about it our faith is the crop right our seeds the seeds of our faith were planted years ago, whether it was by our parents, our grandparents, maybe a coworker or a friend. Everybody has a story to tell. So whomever it was, those seeds were planted and now they're growing, your crop is growing. What are the weeds? They're the sin in our lives, the crosses that we bear. You know, the, basically, you know, the, the pleasures of the world. Money, success, you know, uh, power, all those things that Basically, the weeds are anything that take our focus off of God, that take our focus off of our faith. Those are the weeds in our life. And they rob us of that life-giving moisture that helps our faith grow to its full potential. The grace, that's the rain. We don't have a whole lot of that these days, both figuratively and literally. But the graces are the rain that God pours down on us to grow our faith, to grow our crop to its full potential. So we need that cultivator sometimes to run through our crop to remove those weeds. How do we do that? The number one thing, it has to be important to you. If it's not important to you, then it's just a fad. It's gonna fade away. It's just the next, the next thing you stack in your garage. You know, it's, it's, it has to be important to you. you know, when I 
got on fire for my faith. I mean, you couldn't stop me from reading and learning, and I'm still doing it to this day. A lot of it has to do with this Rome Boys program is just it keeps us going. It keeps us going. But we have to keep in mind when we're thinking about why it's important to us is what's the, what's the goal? You know, what's the end game here? It's to be a saint, right? I mean, everyone in heaven is a saint. We all want to go to heaven, right? Right. So who believes that you can be a saint now? You can change your hand, yeah. If you, don't, if you don't think you can be, why not? Because, I mean, simply, a saint is just simply someone who says yes to God in everything they do. You know, it's not about doing something more. It's just about putting God first in the things you're already doing. So Father Larry Richards, I'm sure some of y'all have heard of him. Father Larry Richards says, either be a saint or go to hell. There are no other options. It's a pretty bold statement. (laughs) What we want determines our destination. Do we want heaven? Do we want the pleasures of the world? What we want determines our destination. I'll give you an example. My wife and I get up every morning at 5 a.m. to go work out. I'm not bragging, it's painful. Trust me, I'm not bragging. But why? Because it's important to us to stay fit. And really, honestly, it's the only time of the day we can get it done with five kids. And and our two-year-old gets up at 5.30 every morning anyway, so we're already up, so you might as well get it done. But it's important to me because as a farmer, Traditionally, farmers have bad backs. I have a bad back. And I, my grandfather owns a chemical business and uh, I've been managing it for several years now. And I have seen over the years, many farmers come in. One cane, I had a customer that came in with two canes because he couldn't walk without it. I even had one farmer just came up to the store and just blared on the horn until somebody came out and took care of it. I'm pretty sure he could walk, I'm not sure, but anyway, I remember that old guy. So our alarm clock clock goes off at 5 a.m. and the first thing I say in my mind is triple D's. Get your mind out of the gutters. (coughs) Triple D's, dedication, devotion, discipline. Dedication to getting up early and getting it done. Devotion to working out so that we stay active. Because I mean, face it, when you're young, you work out so you look good. When you're old, you work out so you can keep moving from all the injuries you sustained from trying to look good. And then there's the discipline of eating healthy and saying no to the garbage. Same applies to our faith. When When we get up after a trip to the bathroom and getting dressed, my wife and I do the liturgy of the hours. Are anybody familiar with the liturgy of the hours? It's a beautiful Catholic devotion. My wife has been doing it for several months now. Uh, she's part of the lay community of trying to discern whether to be a Carmelite. And so she's been doing it for months and I've just recently started to join her because to, to be honest, I've really struggled in my spiritual life. I mean, I feel like I know God up here, you know, through the teachings of the church and through apologetics and just the nuts and bolts of Catholicism. I feel like I know him here, but I struggle with knowing him here. And uh, I I feel like I lack in the relationship part. And, you know, I, you know, the men are supposed to be the spiritual head of the house. And I feel like I am the spiritual head of the house. But my wife is by far the spiritual warrior. She is our prayer warrior for sure. So doing this, dedicating ourselves to God every morning doing this liturgy of the hours has really disciplined myself, you know, in saying no to the garbage of the world, you know, and feeding myself really on godly things. And the devotion, through these devotions, I feel like I've really stepped it up in that relationship part. I don't know, I'm just getting started. It's only been maybe a month. I have to think about that. Maybe it hasn't been a month. I'm not sure, but anyway. If you're looking for a devotion, the church has 2,000 years of different practices and different devotions. Pick one. 
find one that suits you, and get to work. You know, we try to say the rosary every night with our kids, just to kind of instill a little bit of a tradition or a devotion for themselves. There's the Liturgy of the Hours, there's the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and so on and so on. There's so many devotions out there. Find one and pick one and do it. You know, dieting and exercise is a great way to grow in your faith. It really is. Saying yes to the exercise that hurts and saying the no to the cookie that I would rather have, it's a great way to suffer for the Lord. <laughs> but the payoff is worth it, right? Another way to get rid of the weeds in our life is by receiving the sacraments regularly. And the two that we can receive as much as we want is communion and confession. Now tonight I want to focus a little bit more on confession. Not, now don't get me wrong, I'm not to say that the Eucharist is not important. I mean, it's the most important, right? I mean, it's Jesus. How can you get any better than that? But are we receiving him worthily? Are we receiving him properly? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about receiving Jesus in an unworthy manner. That you eat and drink judgment on yourself. The biggest scandal in the church today, in my opinion, is not what the Pope is saying or not saying. It's not what the priests are doing or they're not doing. It's that the communion line is longer than the confessional line. I mean, let's, be, let's face it, there is no confessional line. Are we getting ourselves cleaned up to receive him properly? Because I mean, I was, as he says in Corinthians, Paul says, you know, if we receive and eat him improperly, we're drinking judgment on ourselves that we are guilty of profaning the body of Christ. Some the theologians think that means or believe it to mean that we're guilty of his death. How can we be guilty of his death if it's just a cracker? I got another analogy. Imagine that I have a cardboard cutout life-size cutout of some politician. I'm not going to name one. But a life-size cutout of a politician. And I take it in my backyard and I use it for target practice. I don't recommend this, especially if the Secret Service is listening, I don't recommend this. But let's just say, for analogy's sake, I use this as target practice. Am I guilty of that politician's death? No. It's just a symbol of him. So how can I be guilty of profaning the body of Christ if it's just a cracker? So we need to really, as it says in Corinthians, we need to clean ourselves up. We need to leave our offering and go apologize to our neighbor. We need to clean ourselves up so that we can receive him properly. Our lives depend on it. So one year, my wife for Lent had this great idea. She wanted to, instead of giving something up, she wanted to do something more for Lent. So, okay, what'd you have in mind? I want to go to confession every week during Lent. Wow, that sounds great. I think you're going to get a lot out of that. I think we should do it as a couple. Oh, really? Okay. She was excited. I wasn't so sure. So we said it with Father every Thursday night before Mass, we would go to confession. At first, I had my concerns. But as the more frequently that I be attended confession, the more I began to realize a few things. Chris says on the show a lot that it's this genius in Catholicism. There's a lot of practical impl implications by going to confession uh, more frequently. One, for instance, is uh, I started becoming very aware how sinful I was. I'd be getting ready to commit a sin, whether big or small, and be like, I'm going to have to tell Father. That's not good. So, and it also became to realize how sin affected me. How it affected my mood. You know, I was more grumpy. I was impatient, had a short fuse, became more angry really easily, and I wasn't aware of that until after I had been going to confession more frequently. 
The same thing is true when you don't go to confession frequently. Or I should say the opposite is true. When you don't go to confession for a long period of time, you start becoming numb to the fact that you're even committing a sin. Or that sin is even wrong. You know, I'm a good person. God will forgive me. At least I didn't kill anybody. That's a funny story. I went to a confession one time after listening to a, uh, someone break down the Ten Commandments. Or really, uh, 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 what do you call that? Uh, oh my goodness. Thank you, an examination of conscience. Thank you, Father. He broke it down so general that after it was over with, I felt like I was guilty of them all. As a matter of fact, I told that to Father. I went into confession and said, Father, after listening to that, I feel like I broke every commandment. He said, you killed somebody? I said, no, Father, I didn't kill anybody. He said, but were you so angry that you tore somebody down? Ouch, Father, that one hurt. That wasn't very nice. The more I went to confession, I became very aware of when I was outside of God's grace. I'd lost that love and feeling, you know? It's not that God was pulling that feeling away from me. It was more that I was pushing myself away. I was building a wall. I had damaged the relationship. Every man in here knows, every married man in here knows, that, you know, when you screw up, and notice I said when and not if, there has to be a very difficult and uncomfortable conversation with our wives to kind of heal the damage, right? To make up for the, to repair the damage we have caused before the penance of the flowers and the candies and all of that stuff. This is confession. In John chapter 21, we hear of Peter's confession. We, you know, he sees this is right after the resurrection and Jesus is on the bank and he's making breakfast. And Peter swims and the rest of the guys take the boat, but he swims. And he gets to the bank and the first thing he sees is a charcoal fire. And he's thinking, oh man, here it comes. Because think about it, where's the only other place that scripture talks about a charcoal fire? Just a few, maybe a chapter or verses ahead where Peter denies Jesus three times in front of a charcoal fire. So you have to understand that when, G when Peter comes out of the bank and he sees this charcoal fire, he recognizes it right away because he's been waiting for this. He's been waiting because Jesus called him out. You're going to deny me three times. And then he did it. And so now he's sitting there waiting for this. He's waiting for this uncomfortable conversation to happen. And he sees this charcoal fire and he goes, oh boy, here it comes. The biblical butt chewing of a lifetime. I'm about to get it. And so he sits down and what does Jesus do? After they all start eating, he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Ask him again. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Tend my sheep. He didn't chew him out. He didn't beat him up. He simply wanted to know if Peter loved him. This was his confession. How many times did he deny him? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask him if he loved him? Three times. This is where, by the way, where we get where when we go to confession to say how many times we've committed what sin. So it's not about getting out of hell. It's not about preventing from going to hell. If you go to confession because you want to stay out of hell, I mean, it's a great motivator, don't get me wrong, but who do you love? Yourself. You're doing it to keep yourself out of hell. It's about, confession is about repairing the damage that we have done, that the weeds have caused in our lives. The next thing we should be doing to cultivate our faith is question our faith. Now, I don't mean doubt. That's not what I'm talking about. But questioning our faith. Why? 
Let me ask you a question. How many of you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? You've got to be kidding me. Everybody? Why? I mean, think about it. Through our own human experience, we know that dead people don't come back to life. I lost my grandfather in January. I know he's not coming back. So how is it that we believe that 2,000 years ago, Jesus was crucified, tortured, and died on a cross, and then put in a tomb for three days, and then just gets up and walks out with no medical attention, with no food, no water? How is it we just believe this? From the witness of the apostles, the witness of the ones who've seen him, right? But let's think about this, because we know dead people don't come back to life. What, are really, what really happened? I mean, you have three options. One, the Romans took him. Two, the Jews took him. And three, and this is probably what really happened, the apostles took him. His disciples stole his body, right? So let's debunk these real quick. Number one, the Romans took him. For the first 300 years of Christianity, it was illegal to be a Christian. So the easiest way to stop a movement such as Christianity when you have the body is to produce the body. Just throw him out there. Here he is. Y'all can go home now. Same thing with the Jews. They went through a lot of trouble to have Jesus killed. So what's the easiest way to shut him down when they start preaching he's alive? Produce the body. But that didn't happen either. So the third option is probably the most logical. You know, the apostles took his body. Because think about it. Jesus was like the most famous person in the world, even back then. So they could just live off of his fame. They could go to any town they want, get a free room, free meal, and just live off of his fame the rest of their lives. All they had to do was teach a little bit about what he taught them, and then, you know, say that he was alive, that he came back to life, and we're good to go. We're going to be able to live the cush life the rest of our lives. So how is it we believe them when they say they saw him alive? How did they die? Does anybody know? Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified like Jesus. St. Andrew's brother was crucified in the shape of an X. Let's see. St. James was beheaded. There was a couple of them that were stoned to death. One of them was impaled with a spear. How about St. Bartholomew? Does anybody know that one? You know that one. Any deer hunters in here? No? Anybody ever seen a deer skinned? Yeah, St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Ouch. Yeah. No one dies for what they know is a lie. Let me say that again. No one dies for what they know is a lie. So you have to understand that as soon as that nail is going through Peter's hand, as soon as that knife starts to cut at the skin and they start peeling it back until you're dead, if there is just a teeny weeny ounce of doubt in your mind, maybe we had some bad mushrooms. Maybe we drank too much wine. Maybe we saw a ghost. If there's just a teeny weeny ounce of doubt, you're gonna holler. You're going to scream, he's buried in Peter's backyard. We'll go show you where he's at. But that didn't happen. Every one of them went to their death, proclaiming Jesus to be alive. And not only that, praying for the ones who were torturing and killing them. To me, that is a very creditable witness. We can believe Jesus rose from the dead because they died for it. This is what I mean by questioning your faith. You know, there was a generation that was before us that didn't question their faith. We did it because mom and daddy did it. It's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Sound familiar? In my opinion, that's bad evangelization. The why is what makes it our faith. You know, faith grows by asking questions. Question your faith. Ask why. Why do we genuflect? Why do we make the sign of the cross? Why do we pray to saints? Why do we use holy water? Why, why, why? 
I sound like my six-year-old. But maybe we should ask why. But we can't leave it there. Once you ask that question, now you have to find the answer. You have to find the answer to the question of why. And with today's technology, we literally have the information at our fingertips. I mean, there's websites, there's apps, there's the catechism, there's books, there's prayers, on and on and on. I mean, there's also YouTube, and there's this channel on YouTube. It's got this guy that's a farmer, another guy that's a teacher. I oh, know, sorry, shameless plug. I'll quit. When used correctly, this can be a wonderful tool in growing and cultivating your faith. When used incorrectly, it can be a very useful tool for the devil to plant more weeds. I need to correct a mistake that I feel most of us have already made. I say this because I did. In this analogy of the crop and the weeds, how many of you believe you're the farmer? Didn't question that until I just asked it, did you? We all think we're the farmer. No. We fall into this lie that we are saving ourselves. Jesus is the only one who saves. He is the farmer. We're the dirt. Think about it. Where do you plant seeds? In the dirt. Where does the crop grow? In the dirt. The seeds of faith were planted in us, the dirt, by the Holy Spirit. And he might have used our parents, he might have used our grandparents, our friends, yada yada. But now Jesus is the one who cultivates us. He's the one that grows our faith. However, he's not going to enter our field unless we ask him. When we go to confession, when we repent, Jesus removes the sins. He's the one that removes the sins. He's pulling the weeds. He applies the rain. Think about it. When we choose to go to Mass, when we choose to receive the sacraments, to do our devotions, to learn more about our faith, He pours down the graces on us. The rain that God gives us to grow our crop to its full potential. To produce what? More seeds. More seeds that the Holy Spirit can use to grow more saints. When we follow Jesus or when we ask him to come into our field and to pull our weeds and cultivate our lives, our, be our faith begins to choke out the weeds. So that's what happens in the field. When our crop starts growing, Eventually, when we, if we keep the weeds out and the, and the moisture keeps coming, that crop will grow, excuse me, that crop will grow to the point where the weeds will not do any more damage. It can't do any more damage because the crop is too big. The weeds are still there, but the crop can no longer sustain any damage from them. So, but our faith overcomes those weeds in our life. The saints were sinners. The saints were sinners, but they put their faith in Jesus, the divine farmer, and that allowed them to say yes in everything they did, and that planted seeds of faith in others. Now, you may be wondering, how do we plant these seeds of faith into our children or our fallen away family or, you know, our coworkers or friends? Here's some advice on what not to do. You can't shove the faith down their throats. I've tried, it doesn't work. When I, again, like I said before, when I became really zealous for my faith, everyone needed to become Catholic. I still feel that way, but my approach is different. The best thing that we can do to help the Holy Spirit plant seeds in others is not how much we know about the faith. I mean, that's important, but it's how we live it. How do we live out our faith? It's by being a witness. We believe the apostles when they say Jesus rose from the dead by their witness. Let me give you a little example. It's about confession again. Our kids ask us to take them to confession. How cool is that? 
And it's not because I preached to them and told them how awesome confession is. I hate confession. Honestly, I have a love-hate relationship with confession. I hate going, but I love the way I feel when I come out. Because, I mean, think about it. I'm a guy. I don't like to admit when I'm wrong. Nobody does. I've been married for almost 18 years. I'm getting better. I've had lots of experience. But my kids come to us and they ask us to take them to confession, not by me preaching to them, but because they see my wife and I go. And they see how important it is for us to go regularly. I try to go about every two weeks. Not because I'm holy, as Tony says, because I know how bad I can be. But again, it's not about getting out of jail. It's not about getting out of hell free card. It's about a relationship, about repairing damage that I have done. And they see that and it makes them, it's important to us, so it's important to them. I was wrong. That wasn't a little example. That's huge. My kids are awesome. My six-year-old wants to go. I mean, he's not really at the age of reason to be able to go, but he wants to go because he sees that we enjoy it and that we go. And Father, he, he's great. He lets him come in and gives him a blessing. I would love to be a fly on the wall to hear what he has to tell him. I have a feeling it's about me, but I'm not sure. By building a relationship with people, you know, our friends, our family, our coworkers, eventually they will see the joy in your life because of your faith. And by being a witness. And eventually the questions will start coming. And then you will have the answers for it. Showing them and being an example of how you live out your faith. Being an example of what a real Catholic faith is. We must know our faith. We need to ask why. But then we need to find answers. But most importantly, we need to live it. That's cultivating faith. God bless y'all. Thank y'all so much for putting up with me.